tasks and understanding what you're doing. And so uh, we, when we start working, we just have tripped off each other, and it's continuing even now. Uh, we keep adding pieces to the house, and he and I meet and, and work together on that, and then uh, he'll put something in the space, and then the, the, uh, I'll have some notion to go down there and do something. You're working with somebody whose visual judgment is so good. I mean, everything he does is right. I can't believe it. Every time he moves the table, it's perfect. So I've learned a lot from him. It's been very exciting working with him. And it's been vice versa, and that's really exciting. When you see your work reflected back in the artist's paintings, like you know, it happened at the meeting the other night, which I didn't even realize until, you, until Ray said it that night. Hmm. How about your feelings about future developments in technological materials improvements and how will that affect your view of your art? Well, if they can make a if they can make some kind of serum to make us all smaller so we take up less space, I guess that would, would be something that would I don't know, technology is elusive, you know, I mean, you can get all involved with hardware and it's very expensive. I haven't gotten involved with the uh, whole solar thing uh, because the, build, the type of buildings I've been working on, it would be enormously expensive today to, to uh, with the technology as it's being practiced to accomplish it. It's, so I think it's in a gray area, so I'm not really, uh, I'm waiting. Sort of. I'm interested, and I think it's important. I'm not, but I'm not. That's not where my head goes. Uh, I do get involved with the uh, things like the lighting system I developed for a couple of magnet stores, and then for Rouse. And that's again the intellectual consistency thing. Again, I mean, uh, the this kind of light, bright light, direct light, affects the eye. Uh, cuts visual acuity uh, so that all the buildings that are lit in the world have those direct fluorescent lighting systems with an acoustical tile ceiling. Even the best buildings, even, even Meese, even Caesar. So uh, that offends me, so I try and work on that, those kind of things. and and see if there isn't a way to bring some honesty back into it. Because the electrical engineers say that the direct light is the most efficient thing, and it's the best thing, and so on. They're only talking in terms of numbers and, and tables. Direct light cuts visual acuity by 60, 65%. Uh, so there is also an energy saving. I mean, it, it's almost like if you start from the aesthetic thing, I feel that you find, like, I believe it, it's a, it's a it's a mystic notion. It's, you find truth and honor, you know, honesty, and that good design, good, good aesthetic decisions come down and reflect an economy finally, and, and that's like a law of nature for me. So I, I try to go with that. If you, you know. And. Um, what do you think the future will bring? Seepage. <laughs> I said that before. I think that our economy and our system is in deep trouble. I really feel that. I can see it. It's obvious. I mean, you, and I think we're blowing ourselves up, pretending that it's that it's going to go back to where it was. Or, you know, in fact, I think we really have to change some things seriously. And I think it's going to be difficult for all of us, including myself. I'm having a difficult time dealing with those transitions. But I think that for, for art and, and uh, architecture, the kind of things we're into, it's going to be better. I'm very optimistic that the change in values will somehow reflect and mean better things for, for us. Now, whether it's too little, too late for me and, and the people in this group. Uh, I don't know, but. How about the people in this group? Do you feel any special relationship group-wise, design-wise? 
Well, I... I like uh, them as people, I guess, the, the ones I know. And I feel good being with them a lot, being with or close to somebody that you feel some rapport with. Uh, I feel like I have I've, uh, pursued a, a loner course out here, partly because of my con conviction about developing personal uh, thing rather than, and, uh, but I guess I'm feeling more comfortable lately to be around them, I guess, you know, and, and uh, not as threatened by some of the ideas. I like that the work is a lot, there's a lot of variety in it. It's, I think it's an uneven group. I don't know that our being together has any significance as the 12 because we've left out a few people and, and so on. Uh, but in the sense of trying to develop a dialogue between some decent architects, I think it's, it's worthwhile and I like to see it and I'm very happy. Uh, you know, in awe of John Lautner's, for instance. I think he's a giant genius, incredible. Uh, and, and apparently a very nice man. And uh, I like Caesar's work a lot. I like Caesar Pelli's work. Uh, not all of it, but, but for the most part, uh, I wish he'd get involved in solving the lighting and all those things that I'm worried about, you know, it just, it, it bothers me that somebody else doesn't get in and jump on those things, but, uh, I can't remember who else is, and I, I love Bernard Zimmerman, that's the only reason I'm here. <laughs> How about I think I'm a regional type architect, even though I, I profess to some of the things that uh, Caesar, Pelly, and Lumsden have been saying the last few days at the UCLA thing. That I agree. I, I you know, I like the idea of internationalism and, and uh, this across the country. There's a unification of ideas and things. But I think when the the bottom line is that I'm probably a regional architect, uh, not as apparent maybe as others, but. Uh, I, I love the industrial sections of this town. I love the, the freeways, and I like the kind of lifestyle, living. And I think that's got to reflect somewhere in the work. Uh, I think my attitude about detailing, hanging looser with it, not getting so finicky and precise as, as we used to do, uh, just becoming the editor, getting the job shoved into motion and then becoming the editor that stands there the day the guy's putting up the drywall and saying, hey, wait, stop, leave that open, or quit painting that spot, or something, you know, just sort of fine-tuning it on the, sp on the spot. Uh, I forgot the point I started with. What was it? Yeah. That, well, the detailing, the idea of detailing, uh, hanging loose, a little more with it is, I think, in a, a Los Angeles or California or Western thing. So I would say I'm, I'm very regional. I, I don't always like to admit that. <laughs> I think I, I very involved with the regional attitudes of art more than I am with the with uh, what's going on elsewhere. Yeah, I'm very interested in education, and uh, and it's kind of up. Uh, for, I mean, I think of it as, how would you create tomorrow's clients? I mean, given that you know the people that you're meeting with today and doing work with lack something, they lack an understanding or uh, of what the visual issues mean to them, what the the 
the end of all these decisions is to their lifestyle. And, and uh, so I've, as you know, I've been working with my sister, who's a teacher, uh, developing uh, teaching methods in the elementary school now. Her name is Doreen Nelson. And uh, I think that's progressing very well. I think that, that uh, we're getting a response. We're not only getting a response in terms of, of uh, the visual intellect, but in terms of the other parts. I mean, they're, they're just the normal reading, writing, and arithmetic scores are higher for these kids going through this program. So there's some, it's the old Dewey thing of, uh, of education. It's nothing really new. It's just that maybe the people are, there's a little more reception for it today than when he was trying to do it. Uh, I believe that all, all architects should get involved at that level. I think it's an important, I mean, kids don't, their education doesn't begin with, with the nine o'clock at school and leave and end at three and they come home, your parents, your you, uh, people should be involved more in the, in the process and go to the schools and get into it. When a, an artist or an architect or a musician or somebody goes to an elementary school classroom and talks for an hour, the impact of that is much greater. I mean, think about it. You remember those kind of things 20, 30, 40 years later and those have had, those are the really imprints that are made on your mind. Uh, and, you know, every community has lawyers, doctors, artists, architects of some sort. So that uh, I think it's a responsibility to get into it. Now, again, we'll be creating the, the clients for future generations, but it, it's maybe an interesting just to see if it works. Okay. Still got ten minutes left. Uh, are you comfortable with what you're saying? Okay. Yeah. I need nothing more. Okay. I'll sing. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> Where's the best place to look? Is there looking at you? Or just if I'm talking to her. Yeah, that looks good. Yeah. Okay. All right, the tape's right away. Do you want to start with the influences that helped to shape you? Okay. Um, well, I would have to say that some of the major influences that I'm feeling now, I, I can't speak for, you know, because influences are changing constantly. But I would say at the present time, I am feeling certain influences from the uh, Charles Ames kind of approach to architecture uh, as typified in his house. And that kind of uh, ad hoc approach, I think, is something that I've been thinking about more and more. And uh, I think in a sense it goes back to um, when I was a child growing up, and I was working in my father's office summers, and I was also building hot rods. And the relationship between the two is something that I've been kind of thinking about a lot recently for reasons that are really almost beyond me. Uh, I went over to my mother's house and I got out an old uh, scrapbook that I had made when I was about 17 on the hot rod era that I was living through and I, and I began to realize that before it became commercial at the time when I was involved with it, that it was a real ad hoc art form which was very deeply involved in all of our social activities and it was a way of life, really. And I began thinking how in certain ways the Ames House typified that same sort of an approach to going out and finding materials that didn't really come standard to the, to the automobile or the house, let's say, and putting them together in a way which was like a custom, customizing something in a sense, but using uh, materials that come from a mass-produced uh, uh, industry. So I don't want to talk on that 
particular point too much, but that is something that has been uh, reoccurring in my mind is uh, that sort of an influence out of my past. And I don't know if you want to hear any more. I, uh, I mean, you, you have to tell me time-wise when I should sort of stop on, okay, on each question. I would say that the freeway uh, system in terms of the construction methods that have been used have been influential. I was uh, educated in architecture at Cornell, and then I worked in New York uh, for a number of years, and then I came back to Los Angeles uh, as the main parts of the freeway system were being built. And after having traveled through Europe and so on, I began looking at the freeways with a kind of a fresh eye. Uh, not so much as uh, as transportation systems, but as as uh, technological uh, systems, and uh, the forms fascinated me purely from an aesthetic basis. The the simplicity of the of certain column forms and the way the sun was cast, sun and shadow on the on the on the freeway system, was I think a major influence on the Alexander House. At any rate. And then I think I've had very strong influences from Mexico because I've been working down there since uh, 65, 10 years now, 11 years. So I'm, I have absorbed a lot of influences, I think, from, of course, the uh, pre-Columbian civilizations, I think were very powerful, had great impact on me. And then I think the uh, architecture of Luis Barragan had great influence on me. And of course, the light you see when you get up in Mexico, around Mexico City, and you're up around 7,000 feet, the light takes on a very special kind of a significance. And I think that we have certain areas in the Southwest where we have a similar significance. And I think in Los Angeles, we have a somewhat similar situation, although it's on the ocean, so the light is different. But the quality of light is very different here from the East. And I think that's one of the things that people uh, don't take that much into consideration when they're coming out from the east and talking about architecture on an east-west basis. That I think we're all influenced by the light here, whether we acknowledge it or not. So that would be, I think, the major influences. Well, I think it's becoming a more day-to-day -day process with me in, in terms of um, integrating my work with my life in a, as being like one of the major objectives in what I'm doing. So that the product is um, still important in terms of, of, the, uh, of an expression. Well, the product is important as the expression of a way of life or a life. And so everything I feel is, um, I think that, for example, keeping kind of a balance in my life between architecture and painting and social activities and teaching and uh, other, whatever other aspects, personal relationships with people that are very close to me and so on, are all sort of equally important aspects of my life. And so when you say process, process for me is like a day-to-day -day working with all of those things. And I've never been a kind of a charrette-oriented person, particularly. I, I like to work day-to-day, -day, and the process is something that evolves out of a slow relationship with each thing that I do, which the older I get, I seem to be a little bit more willing to kind of let happen rather than trying to force issues, letting, letting things happen a little bit more, although it's rather difficult for me to do that, to relax and kind of, uh, instead of trying to push clients, you know, to, to sort of relax and let them slowly grow into the project and that type of thing. Are there any projects of yours that are favorite, any favorite projects? Well, I, I think that the two projects which are the, I think the biggest, uh, to me, let's say personal achievements, um, are first the Alexander House in Santa Barbara, which was a process that went on over about a three-year period, and I think um, was an opportunity to delve further into uh, 
a sort of a total concept of architecture than I had done before and get it built. And then uh, I think the other project would have to be the painting that I just finished, which I started about uh, just before Christmas and uh, I've just finished it. And uh, I think that process of learning to deal, um, to work alone on something over, over that long a period of time was a real eye-opening uh, and revealing um, involvement for me to learn more about myself and who I am. So I would say those two projects were the most important to me. Well, I have uh, several different feelings depending upon, well, let's put it this way. I think that I believe in utilizing technology of the areas where I build. I've always felt that way. And uh, somebody was speaking to me here at the school about uh, designing and manufacturing something, some housing here and shipping it to Guatemala. And my reaction to that is that we should uh, maybe go to Guatemala and if we have money, you know, take money with us and try and put it in the right hands and see that, that it's properly utilized, but to uh, develop things here and send them down there is something that I really don't agree with that much. I, I think that first of all, it, it destroys local culture rather than uh, implementing it. And I think that uh, people, and I think, well, I think that's one of my major reasons for not uh, liking the concept of, of exporting technologies. So I believe, I believe very strongly in technology, but in the, in the use of it where it's appropriate locally. So that's, that's one aspect of it. Um, well, I, of course, I mean, I get a little nutty on that subject because I think that, uh, that, uh, that the, the way in which technology is used, let's say, in the United States or in the, you know, the most developed countries of the world in the future is, is the big question that faces the future and whether that technology is going to be used uh, in conjunction with nature or as opposed to nature, I think, is, uh, that's the big question, I think. And, uh, I don't have any idea which way it's going to go. I, I think it's sort of also a question of media versus man, you know, in a sense. I think the media gets involved in that too. The media is really such a great part of technology and, uh, and I think the media shapes man now to a great extent and, and sometimes I almost think that media is controlling man or instead of man, media. So I think it's a very uh, um, life and death struggle that's going on right now. Does that sound nutty? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very what do you think is coming in general? In, in, now you're speaking of in architecture or? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, in a very uh, pragmatic sense, I think that the next uh, 20 to 25 years is going to be the, uh, the big lack of energy period and that we're going to have to struggle through that period, uh, you know, and uh, some people will be more uh, intelligent about the utilization of energy than others. And then I think uh, within the fairly uh, near future that other energy sources will become available and then I think that is when the big changes will start taking place. I think that this era right now is a little bit like the time of Ledoux and, and Boulet where they were dealing with, uh, uh, where they knew the technologies that they were dealing with were kind of outmoded and so they began dealing with form, you know, in that very abstract way that they did. And I think that's why we're seeing this revival of architects as as draftsmen and that, and that sort of thing now. And, and uh, because I think the period, there's a great many similarities between the periods. I think that we know that the technological potential is there, but we can't tap it right now. And I think that's very frustrating to architects. So I think you're seeing, uh, I think that's, that explains what's happening in architecture today, is that we're on the end, or the, just the last tail end of a period and then will come the period of more abundant energy. Interesting. Uh, what 
feelings do you have about uh, relating or your work relating to the other LA 12 architects? Is there any relationship or at all? Any relationship you have with them? Or philosophic relationship? Well, I have a I have this kind of another one of these theories of mine, which is <laughs> based on the uh, newfound relationship that I feel with Craig Elwood, which is something that I never expected. And that is when I went to the art center, I think I mentioned to you, and uh, came out and, and I saw walking across the sidewalk this black beetle. And I realized that that black beetle was native to those California Hills, Pasadena Hills, which was where I was brought up, really. And that thought, that connection I had never really made. I saw that bug and I thought that that was not just pure chance that that bug crossed my path at that point. And then I, I kind of tied that into uh, a kind of a more mystical approach to architecture, which I think has something to do with this light quality that I was talking about before. and. Uh, has something to do with our awareness of um, the kind of thing that uh, Carlos Castaneda talks about in his books. And I think that this is a connection in architecture which is occurring in Southern California today which nobody's really aware of, that there is this sort of connection which, like this black beetle and the black building, transcends our ability to really define it. So. I see it as a kind of a, in painting I would call it magic realism, and I think the same thing is occurring in architecture. I think the Pacific Design Center has that quality because of its hard edge profile, and I think the qualities of the Pacific Design Center that I'm beginning to like more transcend the kind of intellectual feelings that I have about it as related to, say, Klaus Oldenburg and the art of the 60s and extrusions and that sort of thing, and is becoming much more, um, it's the kind of subjective emotional relationship that I feel about it in relationship to the community and what it's doing in the community as a kind of magical presence in that neighborhood. Because I spend quite a bit of time in that area and I see that building from all different places as I'm moving around the city, it's cropping up. And it's doing the same sort of thing that cathedrals do in Europe when you look down Melrose or, or from above or whatever, and you're seeing that building there and it's assuming a presence which is quite imposing and, uh, and I think quite magical in a way. Uh, primarily due to the minimal, we're discovering minimal uh, material usage, which is coming directly out of the art of the 60s. And, uh, I think when you get materials down that minimally and form that pure, then the things start happening that people aren't going to be quite prepared for, you know. So that's I've forgotten what the question was, but anyway, that's the answer. <laughs> well, yes, because I I uh, have discovered that I really love Los Angeles. I think this is a fantastic city. I. I'm not so sure it's a fantastic place to practice architecture per se in the traditional sense, but I think as a, as a city in which to spend time, it's fantastic. And uh, so the activities that I am involved with, the painting and what architecture I do, and what photography and, and so on, uh, I think takes place very well here in this community. It's, I'm not saying that I'm so successful at it, but I think the environment is very appropriate for what I would like to do. Going back to the other question, because we still we have more time, uh, besides Craig, is there any other relationship that you feel to the group? I feel a relationship in certain um, personal ways to John Lautner, I think, in terms of uh, the way he's always practiced architecture. Um, He's made over the years comments to me which in certain cases have not meant a great deal to me when they were made and have come to mean a lot to me as, as time has gone by. Now, one day he came to my office in Pasadena and he said, uh, Bernard is talking so loud I can't keep my train of thought going. That's it.
see, where was I? Okay, Lautner came to my office in Pasadena. This must have been about 1969, 68, and uh, I had at that time four or five people working in the office, maybe a few more, and uh, a secretary at the desk, and she was working on books, on the accounting books. And John came in the door, and he looked at her, and he shouted, uh, books! I've never been able to afford books! <laughs> and I thought, I didn't think much of that at the time, but I always remembered it, and now I can't afford books anymore. <laughs> And it's, uh, you know, it's sort of nice to know that somebody else has gotten through without, you know, being able to uh, be, have all of the fill out in that, in that sort of business end and so on. So I feel that relationship uh, developing. And I would say that I feel that Elwood and Lautner, to me, have been two polarities. And so I would say that, that my other, the other relationships would fall in line, you know, behind those two. And uh, I, because I think that fundamentally I felt that uh, the LA-12 divides in more or less into two groups, one with Lautner and one with Elwood. And that uh, there's a lot of crossover and there's more and more crossover as time goes by, but I see those as the two polarities. So that would be how I would see myself relating to the group as relating to those two people in those two, two ways, you see. No, the only other thing that I, that I wanted to say was that I also, in the midst of all of this, um, am, am keeping a journal, which is a record of my, more or less my feelings and so on as I go along. And it's a very, becoming a very important aspect of what I do, and it's a very private aspect. It's like, it's the aspect which will never be revealed to, to anybody else. And uh, I just wanted to mention that because um, I feel that I could mention such an important aspect because it is like another whole maybe quarter of my creative existence that's going into this thing, but which is purely being done for selfish reasons. And so that, that's another aspect of what I'm doing, which is important to me. No, I think I've pretty much covered it's on my mind. How much time have we? We still have 10 minutes left. Really? I thought we went about 25 minutes. We did. Was that, oh, was no, we only went 20 minutes. Really? Yep. Is that enough? Maybe that's enough? No, it's up to you. Well, it was a good, very good conversation. I don't think I have anything too much more to say, unless, you, you know, it would get very detailed if I was to talk much more. I could talk about the latest project that I'm working on or starting to work on. In terms of the process and how you're developing it, that idea could relate to the design process question. You could, uh, um, you could talk about the process of how to develop a new project that would relate to the design process question. Okay, well, this, this is related to uh, the question on design process, which for me, I think, takes, takes a number of different forms depending upon, um, now I'm getting into details now, d different forms depending upon the, pro the type of project that I'm working on. And uh, I have been, I have done one project which wasn't completed, which was a small house in Venice which was designed to accommodate uh, a variety of, of programmatic uses that are a little bit different than the traditional house. And they developed out of my belief that there would be a growing number of residential clients who would be uh, couples who were both actively engaged in, in their own work. And that I felt that that was going to be a a significant segment of, of clients that might be coming to me in the future would probably turn out to be people who were really involved in some sort of professional or creative or other work, either in the home or out of the home, but that they probably would be doing a certain amount of it at, at the home. And so I developed a kind of a theoretical house that would house uh, this kind of house usage 
and just built models and made drawings of it. And then uh, after that was completed, a, a client came in who kind of filled the bill, and we went through a design process for them, but the project never was completed because they decided to buy a big, it actually turned out that a big used old house was much better for them than, than this new, new thing, which had to be very restricted because of economics. So then I realized that if this process was going to have meaning in the future, that economics would have to be a, a great part of it, and that, uh, but that it was still an interesting concept. And so when another client came to me who was a uh, hydraulic engineer who was interested in uh, having a machine shop in his house and working with motorcycles and various kinds of an invention, inventions and so on, I saw it as a possibility of developing this concept further. And so I'm working on the design of a house now which is essentially divided into three parts. The part nearest the street is, is garage and shop area. And the part, the central part is an open courtyard where the wife does her work, which is a kind of a hydrotherapy, which she does in a hot jacuzzi type of pool, about 10 feet square. And then there'll be a narrow uh, pool for swimming laps of cooler water and then a small jacuzzi. So that arrangement is all a very functional working part of the house. And then the front third of the house will be a more, uh, the more traditional parts of the house. But the trick of the whole thing to me is going to be to do something which can uh, be built within a very, very uh, strict economic budget so that the structural system will probably be something that can be erected very quickly and in a very short time, hence that interest that I was mentioning in the Ames uh, steel house. I'm thinking more in terms of using wood columns and, and prefabricated wooden trusses just from a cost standpoint. But that was where that interest came. And uh, it's also interesting to me that uh, both uh, Charles and Ray Ames are actively involved in the work, but that it's totally separated from their house. But I've examined their lifestyle enough so that I really know what goes on. They get up in the morning, they go to the office where they both work together, and they stay there until maybe 7 or 8 or 9 at night, and then they go home and sleep, and then they come back. Uh, and obviously, maybe that well, let's say maybe that separation has some meaning for them, and maybe it just happened accidentally. Maybe they would be better off living above, ideally living above where they were working or something. But that was one of the of the situations that I was kind of exploring and thinking of a creative couple, you know, which seemed to me they seemed to be sort of the archetypes of this thing that's coming that I see more coming, hopefully coming in the future. You see. So this house is, in a sense, designed to, uh, to fill these kind of new roles, and it comes out of the fact that I think that even amongst the middle and lower uh, income groups in, in Southern California, um, as you go through these neighborhoods, you see people working on their motorcycles and their cars and, and other various creative activities, and these are usually relegated to the garage. So what I'm thinking of is that housing in the future for, let's say, East Los Angeles uh, might conceivably be somewhat along the designs of the prototype that I'm working on now, which would bring these creative work things more closely in and in a more accepted way into the house the, rather than relegating them to a sort of second class situation in the garage. Now all of this is very idealistic because it takes money, which most people don't have, to do this. And that's where it perhaps falls apart. But on the other hand, uh, be, even be, I feel that there is a validity in exploring this beyond the economics of it, because I feel that something may happen to the economics at some time in the future which might make this more possible, so that it should be explored. So that maybe explains some process. Do you think that's enough? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's time's up. Okay, great. Okay, so the idea is that they'll sit us here and serve us wine and they film us and they, so the whole thing will just how 12 parking to get stoned. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Are you done? No, I'm anxious to start. I'm anxious to hear what you're Hey, Jim, how are you? Hey, Jim, how are you? Which side do you want me to take?